It's summertime and I'm ready to rest, relax, and catch some rays. Well, don't forget your sunscreen. Of course I won't. I also won't forget my Kefla Organics CBD. Good plan. Kefla Organics is one of my favorite ways to relax and enjoy the benefits of CBD, whether I'm at home with a tea reading some true crime or laying at the beach on my day off. Kefla Organics is a fair trade, vegan, refined, sugar-free CBD company. And at keflaorganics.com, you'll find chocolate bars, hot cocoa, chai lattes, and more, making the taking of CBD a lot more enjoyable than a regular tincture. And Murder in the Rain listeners can get 20% off using the promo code RAIN20. So follow at Enjoy Kefla on social media and visit keflaorganics.com. Use the code RAIN20 at checkout to save 20% while enjoying guilt-free, stress-reducing, sleep-assisting, delicious Kefla Organics CBD products. If you're into spooky stuff like folklore and ghosts, you've likely heard of the term residual haunting. The concept is pretty simple. A traumatic event like a murder results in negative energy seeping into the area and causing a haunting, one that often results in one or more ghosts trapped in their traumatic death. The popular television show Supernatural introduced the catchy term death echo, which summarizes it pretty nicely. Someone trapped in their death, reliving it over and over and over again like a horrifying loop. For years, co-eds at Oregon State University have speculated that their very own quaint little campus in the valley is home to multiple hauntings and possibly even a death echo that has been in place since the 1970s. Roberta Kathleen Parks, known as Kathy, was from Lafayette, California. Kathy was beautiful. She had long, silky brown hair parted down the middle, cheekbones for days, and gorgeous full lips. Like many teens, she was drawn to Corvallis, Oregon with the desire to become an OSU student. At 20 years old, she was living a normal life, studying regularly as a world religions major and nursing a broken heart because she broke it off with her boyfriend. Friends noted that there was evidence of this impacting her greatly. She was drinking more alcohol, falling behind in classes, and recently skipping class altogether. Her boyfriend, Christy McPhee, was a scuba diving instructor from Berwick, Louisiana. He loved her very much and possibly moved their relationship a little too fast for Kathy. They lived together for a brief time prior to breaking up. Christy and Kathy exchanged letters frequently, and in one of them, Kathy describes that she loved him very much, but didn't see a life with him right now. She was very young and wanted to experience life. Despite having broken up, Kathy was very much still in love with her boyfriend and carrying a lot of stress and grief over the breakup. To make matters worse, after the breakup, she got into a big fight with her father and then found out later that day from her sister Sharon that he suffered a massive heart attack and nearly died. Luckily, he survived. And perhaps to avoid all of the woes in her life, Kathy decided to spend the evening with her friends. On May 6, 1974, Kathy and her roommate Miriam Schmidt planned to join their friends in another room at Sackett Hall before heading out to grab some coffee. Kathy decided she wanted to take a quick stroll and grab some late dinner at the Memorial Union cafeteria, what the students call the MU. And then she said, I'll meet you afterwards. Kathy stepped out of her room at Sackett Hall at around 11 p.m. And while on her way, she bumped into her friend Sherelle Smith. After a quick chat, she headed outside and ran into yet another friend, Lorraine Fargo, who was walking back to Sackett Hall after a night of studying at the library. Lorraine noted that when she saw Kathy walking outside, she looked dazed, out of sorts, and kind of forlorn. So she stopped to have a quick chat and decided, yes, she was very depressed. Kathy told Lorraine about her issues with her boyfriend, her father's heart attack, and Lorraine offered her a shoulder to lean on. However, Kathy said she preferred to spend some time alone and take a walk. Then poof, she was gone. No one else saw her. She never arrived to meet with her friends that evening. And that's when it started. She disappeared and suddenly there were whispers in Sackett Hall of strange happenings. Footsteps in the halls, curtains moving on their own, slamming doors throughout the building, and even unexplained sounds and sightings. Were these events foreshadowing a terrible outcome to the explanation of what happened to Kathy? 
In the months after Kathy's disappearance, other women went missing. That summer, two women disappeared at Lake Sammamish State Park, just outside of Seattle. Witnesses saw both women interact with a young man before leaving the park. By fall, remains were discovered by two hunters walking along a service road in Issaquah, just about two miles from the park. They were determined to be the remains of Janice Ott and Denise Nasland, the missing girls from the park earlier that year. A few more months later, another shocking discovery was made in the forest surrounding the Taylor Mountain Trailhead in Issaquah, Washington. Forestry students from Green River Community College discovered a skull, and within days, the remains of six young women were found. And one of those women was Kathy Parks. Perhaps you've already started to figure it out, but the remains on Taylor Mountain were left there by the infamous Ted Bundy. By now, you're all very well aware of Ted Bundy, the co-ed killer who died by electric chair in 1989. Just before his death, Ted Bundy admitted to killing an estimated 30 victims between 1974 and 1978. But we've talked about this before. No one really knows how many are out there because he's a very cunning liar who liked to play games with those around him. Bundy's typical method of murder was to trick someone into helping him, knock them unconscious, load them into his Volkswagen so he could take them to a secluded area to rape and murder them by strangulation. He often returned to the area to adorn the women with makeup before engaging in necrophilic acts, defiling their bodies because murder wasn't enough for him. There were even those he decapitated, taking the head with him as a token of his disgusting deeds. But why Kathy? Well, in Kevin Sullivan's book, The Trail of Bundy, a theory emerges— Bundy was stalking Lorraine Fargo. Lorraine studied alone until late that evening in the library, and Bundy was there watching her. But as she left to return to her dorm, and by a twist of fate, she bumped into her forlorn and vulnerable friend, Kathy. That's perhaps when Bundy saw an opportunity. Maybe she went willingly. Maybe he violently grabbed her. But that night, Ted Bundy stole her away from her life, drove her hundreds of miles away. He raped her. He killed her, and he left her there with his other victims in Taylor Mountain Forest. Ted Bundy later admitted that on May 6, 1974, he was in Corvallis looking for a victim in an attempt to throw off police who were looking for a serial killer in Washington. Bundy himself described a hypothetical situation to author Stephen McCod, who wrote about it in his book, Conversations with a Killer. I'll paraphrase it, but it's pretty chilling, so I highly recommend reading his exact words. He describes how the killer maybe saw her sitting alone in a cafeteria, looking depressed or lonely. Maybe he struck up a conversation with her and let her believe he was a student. Maybe they could go together to a local tavern and get a drink. Could that cheer her up? The killer, likely not wanting any witnesses to see a struggle, was patient enough to gain her trust, but not patient enough to sit through an actual drink at a tavern. So perhaps once she was in his car, he told her a lie that he needed to pick up a copy of his thesis, but instead he drives her to a remote location to play out his dark fantasies. Uh, I just want to say it's interesting because we have touched on Ted Bundy on the um, the Anne episode, and he did the same thing. He didn't confess to Anne. He did a hypothetical. He did a hypothetical. You know, if someone was to start, they'd probably that was be pretty thing. young, he and wanted... the victim was probably about nine, and da da da. And he so wanted it's... to brag about it. He wanted to tell them, but he didn't but he's still a want coward. to admit it. <laughs> He didn't want to admit it. Yeah. So it's interesting of just the consistency of whether it's from when I'm 14 and it was a nine-year-old girl or now I'm however old and it's a college-age girl. It's still, I can't quite have the balls to say that this is what I did. So Mm -hmm. I'll just toy with you. Oh, and he just wanted to play a game with them. He knows how badly they wanted to resolve this and 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 have him admit it. Isn't it kind of crazy? Like Ted Bundy is world known, like everybody knows Ted Bundy and he was doing the stuff he was doing like in your hometown. Yeah. Like, that's wild. It is wild. Corvallis is like freaking hell uh, Right? I, hell, hell. You know, at the time, I didn't realize anything. I maybe yeah. heard a rumor or two or, you know, usually there's some sort of folklore about a fire and some ghost is in there. But to grow up and do all these cases and I'm still not through them. Yeah. It's insane. And it's not like it's a big old city. The students who live in Sackett Hall think maybe he killed her there in the basement or the catacombs, as many people call it. Rumors of secret passageways under the building, thought to be bomb shelters from the past, were now used as storage, and some students believed 
that her screams could be heard in those hidden spaces of the basement. Perhaps it's Kathy stuck in a death echo, roaming the halls, slamming the doors, and moving furniture. Maybe she's there trying desperately to get the attention of someone, anyone, to save her from the monster who kills her over and over. But most of us true crime fans know that's likely not the case. While he does have some incidents of breaking into homes with multiple people, he certainly preferred killing and raping in a more remote location, one he could simply leave her body at and walk away. But perhaps the students were trying to come to terms with what happened to Kathy, and the result is a legendary haunting. If Kathy does haunt the halls of Sackett, she is not alone. One student, Jane Anterbury, wrote an article about her brush with the supernatural. She woke in the middle of the night to find a girl with glowing eyes sitting on her dresser. When she asked her roommate the next day if it had been her and was told no, she started doing her own research and learned about Kathy Parks, but also about a long-standing urban legend that a student named Becky was stabbed to death on campus in the 1950s. The lore says she shows up sitting in dorm rooms all over campus, radiating anger over her violent death with glowing eyes. That's who Jane thinks she met that night. Oh, that's spooky. Mm, I know. Not far from Sackett Hall, you'll find Waldo Hall, the building I spent the majority of my time at when I went to Oregon State. Waldo Hall, now an anthropology building, was open to students in 1907 and was used as a girls' dormitory. One of the school's very first librarians, Ida Kidder, lived in that building for 12 years. Two years before her death, her dream library was built on campus, and she kept her duty as librarian even though her health was deteriorating. She was known to travel around campus on a little motorized cart, and students referred to her as Mother Kidder. Two years after her library opening, she died in her bed at Waldo Hall, and some say she's never left. My archaeology professor Dave Bronner would tell me all sorts of spooky happenings you would possibly experience when you were alone in Waldo Hall at night. One student said that she had a chat with a woman in the bathroom while they were washing their hands, and then they leave the bathroom and she turns to say something to her and she disappeared. Some have heard humming or singing in that same bathroom only to find out that there's no one there. The entire fourth floor of the building was eventually boarded up and rumors started flying. Footsteps, sounds, things moving, you name it. Even a popular ghost hunting show visited the campus to cover Waldo Hall in an episode. But I'm pretty sure they didn't get anything because the episode didn't air, but I do remember them being on campus. Whether it's a side effect of my obsession with Dave's stories or a real encounter, I recall being one of the last few people in the building one night... I was washing up in the bathroom after a particularly gruesome day of working in the faunal lab when I felt like someone was watching me. You know that sound that it's like something technology buzzing, it's really quiet, but you can hear it and you can feel it? Yeah. I felt that all around me. And I was 100% sure there was someone in that bathroom with me. So I jetted out of there and went home. However, my home at the time wasn't much more comforting. In my last year at Oregon State, I lived in a small two-story white house on 17th Street. Many of the alumni of those years will remember this house as we threw some excellent theme parties. You really did. You went to a couple of them. I sure did. Anyway, while living at the house, a number of unexplained things happened. First, I was in the kitchen making a snack, alone, and out of nowhere, the bathroom sink turns on full blast. I'm talking both handles turned all the way, pipe completely open. I stood there for a minute in total shock, turned it off, and waited patiently to retell the story to one of my many roommates. When I finally got to tell the story, they looked at me and said, I thought I was the only one. (gasps) Apparently, he had been brushing his teeth, turned off the faucet, and tapped his toothbrush to let the remaining water fall off the toothbrush, and full blast. Which it's, you know, a little drip here and there is acceptable. But yeah, you didn't blast. turn it off all the way and you tap, tap, tap and you bump it. Right. And it but I'm talking a little both handles <sighs> full on. So, you know, that's easy to explain, I suppose. Old pipes. The house has been there forever. But I lived with my good friend, Jessica, who I think we've talked about a few times. Mm-hmm. And she's been known to have a few episodes of sleep paralysis. When we lived in that house, she experienced it more frequently and more intensely than any other time in her life. 
She would tell me about how at night she would lay in bed unable to move and she would hear demonic whispering or the voices of children murmuring in her ears. One particularly bad night, she saw the form of a huge black mass in the corner of her room looking at her. Now, most of the time I would laugh these things off, blaming alcohol or maybe she was just having a very vivid dream. But one day while we were skipping class to watch a movie, we were each laying on a couch and we weren't asleep. We were kind of talking throughout the, the movie, but she got really quiet and I just had this really terrible feeling she was about to experience it. So I kind of I was listening and she's like kind of whining like and I, I get up and I walk over to her and I'm like, are you are you having an episode? Do you need help? And she's like, and this is going to sound really funny, but she's like, hey, help me and I could hear help me help me so I I was like so creeped out but I reach over and I pull the blanket back and she just like awakes and can move her body and she's like thank you that was so creepy it was really bad and then I realized okay she's not lying these things really happened to her but it happened I mean multiple times a week I felt terrible yeah I was gonna say all of that is sleep paralysis like the seeing things like I see people when I have it and stuff but um the frequency, you know, mm-hmm. it depends on the person. And I think everyone kind of has the everyone that has sleep paralysis kind of has their patterns. You know, for me, I'm very lucky. It's not very often. But yeah, to have it suddenly spike up like that's mm-hmm. something out of a horror movie. She where it's had like it the energy is twice, I think, since we moved out of the house. And that, wow. and when we lived there, she lived there for a few years. Mm-hmm. It happened all the time. That's wild. Now, there were other things that happened over the years. One roommate claimed she knew there was a ghost of a man living in the back bedroom with her. And, you know, things would be misplaced. We'd set something one place and it would arrive in another. And we didn't really think about it. Nothing really scary happened. But here's the mind blowing part. My dad lived in that very house when he was a student at OSU. So crazy. And he has his own and highly more intense experiences. So my dad was an OSU student in the early 80s. And him and my mom lived in the upstairs portion of the house. It was two two stories. The upstairs was a like one bedroom apartment or a studio. The downstairs had three bed, three and a half bedrooms. There's a little tiny like reading nook. So my mom and dad lived in the very top and they had friends in the bottom portion. So first there was the rolling paint can in one of the back bedrooms, one of the more actively creepy rooms that my friend mentioned, the male ghost. uh, They had this full can of paint that they would use to touch up the walls. And They couldn't explain it, but every once in a while, it would just fall on its side and roll around the room. And they would make a joke talking to the ghost of the house, and they'd set it up, but they would check it out. The floor was even. You couldn't knock it over. It was full. Right. So that's where it started. Then multiple people saw one day a dresser drawer open and just socks and shirts flying out of it. My dad explained it like you could see a prank being set up where there's maybe fishing. And he went over there and like tried to check if somebody was playing a prank. And he said, nope, it was so creepy. It was just flying out. That's wild. And for the record, Keith Rowney is a sensible scientist, scientist, (laughs) intellectual person. (laughs) Like he's not, uh, you know, looking for the spooks he loves to spook people yeah but he is definitely a scientist so of course he would have explored it now my favorite of all of his stories is a good one i got to hear it from his perspective as well as my mom's so my mom is upstairs sleeping and my dad is downstairs having beers with his roommates and all of a sudden my mom comes flying down the stairs half naked screaming about a ghost now my mom tells me she's laying in bed with the door open, the screen door shut so she can get a breeze. And she hears the door open and close. You know that sound of a screen door. Mm -hmm. Josh, you should insert a sound of a screen door closing. (laughs) Feels someone sit on the bed next to her and she starts talking, assuming it's my father, but doesn't get a response. So she opens her eyes and no one's there. And she swears that when she got up to run down those stairs naked, she bumped into someone. Oof. Now, my dad's favorite spooky story, <laughs> he said one time his my mom and him were out of town. Uh, their family's from Chicago. So I have a feeling they were there visiting. They got back and the neighbor was asking them all these questions about the woman living with them. And he's like, what are you talking about? And they were adamant 
that they have seen an old lady in the window of the upstairs apartment regularly. I know. So my dad (laughs) talks to the owner and he mentioned that the house was a farmhouse. It was on an apple orchard for Oregon State and it was moved. So the house was totally moved to 17th Street. And prior to my dad living there, many, many years prior, an old woman lived there. Her name was Nancy Pugh and she died in the house (gasps) in like the 1920s. And my dad thinks... She's That's still there her. and it's her. And maybe she's ready to scare the shit out of OSU students for years to come. That is very spooky. I know. Um, I tried to find her. I There's lots of Nancy Pews. I can't locate it. I'm still looking. I want to prove this story. <laughs> um, Josh, please use a sensor button for this name. Like, it makes sense that that house is haunted. Let's not forget I had my first kiss and makeout session with at that house. That shit is haunted. (laughs) You did? (laughs) Hey, true crime listeners. Did you ever listen to a true crime podcast and felt like you're left with questions like, why did she do it? Or how could this have happened to her? Then you'll definitely want to check out our podcast, Women in Crime. I'm Amy Slashberg. I'm Megan Sachs. My co-host and I are both criminologists. We've spent our entire career studying crime and both have firsthand experience working within the criminal justice system. Each episode, you'll hear a new female-focused case or topic deconstructed by experts. You'll hear the stories of these women, but you'll also learn why these crimes happened and whether or not the criminal justice system got it right or not. Crime is different for women. Come listen and learn why, as each episode we talk women in crime all of the time. So hit pause and subscribe to Women in Crime today on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. That's Women A-N-D Crime.